Welcome to part two of chapter six, alkyl halides and nucleophilic substitution. So part one of chapter six covered the classes, characterization, reactivity, um, nomenclature of halides, and even allylic bromination with NBS or n bromosexinamide. Part two of chapter six will cover substitution reactions of alkyl halides. So in general, a substitution reaction is a reaction in which we have an attacking species and it's going to replace some other group. So in nucleophilic substitution, our nucleophile, which can be uh, shorthanded nuke with a lone pair negative charge, our nucleophile will be our attacking species and our leaving group, which will be halogens, in this example, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, any halide, is going to be replaced with the nucleophile. So there's two different ways in which this can occur. There's SN2, which is a bimolecular nucleophilic substitution, and SN1, which is unimolecular. So here we just have a general idea of what nucleophilic substitution can look like. Here we have our substrate, or even this can be our alkyl halide. It's going to react with a nucleophile or our nucleophile will attack our substrate and it will switch places with where our halide was. It's going to substitute. So as mentioned above, there are two different ways in which this can occur. So we're going to go through both SN1 and SN2, differentiate between the two and see which factors make up um, these reactions. So SN2 reaction is bimolecular. The reason why we say that this reaction is bimolecular is because the rate of reaction is dependent on two factors, the concentration of our substrate or our alkyl halide, and it's also dependent on the concentration of our nucleophile. Because our rate of reaction is dependent on the concentration of our nucleophile, SN2 reactions require a strong nucleophile. Also, nucleophiles in SN2 reactions will attack from the backside. So this will influence stereochemistry, and because we attack from the backside, we will have conditions for our substrate, in which we'll get into. But right now, let's focus on our nucleophile. What makes a nucleophile a strong, moderate, or weak nucleophile? Well, first, a negatively charged nucleophile will be stronger than its neutral counterpart. So if we were to compare something like a methoxy ion, CH3O negative, versus its neutral counterpart, which is methanol, the methoxy ion is going to be stronger because it's negatively charged. Or even if we were to look at water, versus a hydroxy ion. Our hydroxide ion is going to be stronger because of the negative charge. Or if we look at NH2 negative versus NH3, anytime you see a negative charge, that's going to be uh, relatively a stronger nucleophile. So let's talk about trends of nucleophilicity on the periodic table. So nucleophilicity will decrease going from left to right. So the far left will be the strongest, so nitrogen. And then the far right will be weak. Carbon and oxygen will be moderate and fluorine is going to be your weakest nucleophile. So let's look at these four different nucleophiles right here. Let's rank these four in order from strongest nucleophile to weakest nucleophile. 
Well, we can see that we are comparing nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and carbon. So we know that it decreases going from left to right. So our strongest is going to be our nitrogen containing nucleophile. Then carbon as our second strongest. Oxygen as our third and fluorine as our weak weakest. Nucleophilicity also increases going down the periodic table. So as we increase in size, so if we were to compare our halogens, fluorine again is going to be our weakest nucleophile, then chlorine, bromine, and then iodine. But this also kind of makes sense, and we could actually recognize that the trend in nucleophilicity is the complete opposite in trends of electronegativity. And electronegativity is all about bringing in or collecting electrons, right? Whereas nucleophilicity, we're attacking, we're giving away electrons. So it makes sense that if fluorine is really good at bringing in electrons, because it's electronegative, very electronegative, then it makes sense that it is not a great nucleophile. It's not really great at donating or giving away because all of its power really goes from, goes to absorbing electrons. So yeah, just a little side note, how nucleophilicity trends are the complete opposite of um, electronegativity. So now that we've gone over um, requirements of uh, nucleophiles and what a strong, moderate, or weak nucleophile, going back to um, nucleophiles attack from the backside of our substrate. So the orientation of our substrate is an important factor in SN2 reactions. So a methyl substrate is going to be the most favorable substrate for SN2 reactions. They will undergo SN2 reactions the fastest. So if we were to look at this methyl chloride, if we wanted to attack with OH as our nucleophile, it would be very easy for this OH uh, group to really snag, uh, to really come snag in here and attack the the carbon from the box side, uh, from the back side, because all we have are hydrogens. Hydrogens have a a, a small shell, and so um, really easy to squeeze behind here. If we were to look at a methyl, or excuse me, we just went over methyl, a primary. or even a secondary substrate. Here we would just have to worry about our nucleophile. Um, with this being primary, we are still able to have a backside attack. Um, we can still easily access that carbon. Here on this secondary substrate, it's still possible, but the reaction will be a little bit slower because there may be some interference because of these two um, methyl groups. Lastly, if we were to have a tertiary substrate, which cannot undergo SN2 reactions because they are too bulky, they they cause steric hindrance. And so I'm actually going to draw out all of our carbon and hydrogen bonds so that way we can see um, just that hindrance that we're talking about. If we were to expand all of our carbons and hydrogens, I think now it's easier to see how those hydrogens and carbons are all really interfering with each other. We've got a lot of commotion going on right here and, and right here. And so it'd just be really hard and for for there to be a backside attack of um, our carbon from our nucleophile so with methyl substrates these will undergo sn2 reactions the fastest then primary and then secondary substrates will be the slowest 
and tertiary substrates cannot undergo SN2 reactions. That is very important. SN2 reactions are also a concerted reaction. What does concerted mean? This means that our bonds are forming and breaking all at the same time. So as our nucleophile is attacking, our halogen is leaving at the same time. Because this is a concerted reaction, we cannot undergo any rearrangements. This is happening all at once. SN2 reactions do favor polar aprotic solvents. Aprotic solvents don't have acidic protons, therefore they can't form any hydrogen bonds. So examples would be um, acetonitrile, DMF, acetone, DMSO. Um, crown ethers are a very um, are a solvent that are very favorable for SN2 reactions um, because they can um, increase the strength of um, anions and so they can in a way uh, help our nucleophiles become better but you just really need to know polar aprotic solvents um, cannot form hydrogen bonds and these are some examples the stereochemistry of SN2 reactions will completely invert. So let's go over an example. I have a methyl bromide and it's going to react with a hydroxide ion. So let's go on ahead and just analyze what we have at first so that way we know that this is an SN2 reaction. One, we do see that this is a negative charge, so we do have a strong nucleophile. If we uh, characterize our substrate, this is a methyl bromide. And as we stated, methyl substrates are very favorable for SN2 reactions. So we know this is an SN2 reaction. This is concerted, so our bonds are forming and breaking all at the same time. So as our nucleophile attacks from the backside of our carbon, our bromine, which is our leaving group in this example, is going to leave at the same time. So SN2 reactions, you should always have two arrows. There is no intermediate. There is no uh, forming a cation or undergoing any rearrangements. We simply just replace our bromine with our OH group. So in this example, I did not go over stereochemistry, um, but I am going to use the same example um, to show what we mean by completely inverted. Um, I actually lied, I'm not going to use the same example. <laughs> Okay, let's look at 2-bromobutane and let's react this with still our hydroxide as our nucleophile. This carbon, um, here we do have a secondary substrate. So this will be a slower reaction, but it, secondary substrates can still undergo SN2 reactions. And again, with that negative charge, uh, that's a strong nucleophile. So we're going to have a backside attack of our nucleophile. And here's what our transition state looks like. Again, this is concerted, so our bonds are forming and breaking at the same time as our nucleophile attacks our bromine leaves. 
And we can see that here with our transition state. As we're forming a bond with our carbon from our hydroxide, our bromine will be leaving. So that's what our transition state looks like. We have this bond forming while this bond is breaking. That for transition state. Now, our final product showing our stereochemistry is going to look like this. And so we can see how we have completely inverted our structure. So if we start with the R configuration, then we'll end with the S configuration. Or if we start with S configuration, then we end with the R configuration. And so right here, we're starting with R, And over here we have one, two, three, counterclockwise, S. So that's what stereochemistry looks like for SN2 reactions. And that is what the SN2 mechanism looks like. I'm going to go over another example. I'm going to use line angle now. If we analyze our substrate, we see that our Chlorine is primary. Here we have sodium cyanate. Now, this is an ionic bond. So what actually happens in this reaction is our sodium and our CN will break into positive and negative charges. And so this is actually going to be acting as our nucleophile. So we'll have a backside attack of our carbon to our uh, of our nucleophile to our carbon, which will then kick our chlorine off. And that's what our SN2 reaction looks like. So now let's go to SN1 reactions. SN1 reactions are unimolecular. And that's because the rate of reaction is dependent on only one factor, and that's the concentration of our substrate. We are not dependent on the concentration of our nucleophile. And because of that, we actually uh, don't need a strong nucleophile whenever it comes to SN1 reactions. The substrate stability will be the complete opposite of SN2 reactions. So tertiary and secondary will actually be more favorable than methyl and primary. And the reason is, is because this is a multi-step reaction. Um, this is not concerted. Our bonds are not forming and breaking all at the same time. We will be generating a carbocation uh, carbo intermediate and because of that, we can undergo rearrangements like hydride and methyl shifts. And so this is a way where we can pretty much upgrade our intermediate
maybe from methyl to primary or methyl to primary. That doesn't sound right. We can pretty much upgrade our um, intermediate to secondary or tertiary. Now, we may not always be able to undergo shifts, but they are possible. SN1 reactions will also favor polar product solvents. And so polar product solvents contain acidic protons, so they are able to uh, form hydrogen bonds. So water and alcohols are um, perfect examples of polar product solvents. Because we can generate um, intermediates, we don't necessarily have to attack from the back side like we do in SN2. Um, for our stereochemistry, we'll create a mixture of um, R and S reaction uh, of R and S um, final products. So for the first example of an SN1 reaction, here, if we analyze our reaction, looking at our substrate, our chlorine is secondary and we can see that secondary is favorable for both SN1 and SN2. So let's take a look at our water, our nucleophile. Water is a polar product solvent, and polar product solvents favor SN1 reactions. And so we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is going to be an SN1 reaction. So the first step is we're going to form our carbocation intermediate. And this occurs by having our leaving group or our halide leave. Halogens are electronegative. They're good leaving groups, so they're able to pull themselves right off of that substrate. So now we have a secondary carbocation we can see that it's connected to one, two carbons, making it secondary. In this example, I am not going to show a hydride or methyl shift just so that way we can get the general idea of an SN1 reaction. After you form your carbocation, then comes step two, where we're going to have an attack of our nucleophile. So the entire water molecule is going to attach itself. Oh, whoopsies. Is going to attach itself to the carbocation. We know that oxygen is divalent. However, we're using one of its lone pairs to connect to our substrate, leaving it with only one other lone pair. So this oxygen is going to have a positive charge. So how do we get our oxygen back to a neutral state? Step three, we're going to depronate. So using the same nucleophile that we used, which is water, it's going to grab one hydrogen connected to our water molecule and the bond between our oxygen and hydrogen will go back to the oxygen as a lone pair.
So now our oxygen is back to having two lone pairs. It's in a neutral state. We will have some hydronium ion um, left over. But that is how we undergo an SN1 reaction without uh, hydride or methyl shifts. Step one, our leaving group, our halide leaves, forming our carbocation intermediate. Step two, our nucleophile, in this example, water, will attack our carbocation, attaching the entire molecule, leaving it in a positive state. To get rid of that positive state and put our um, oxygen in a neutral state, we're gonna deprotonate with the water molecule to remove a hydrogen giving us an alcohol where our oxygen is neutral and some hydronium ion as some side product. So let's undergo another example. Where now we're going to use um, our hydride or methyl shift. So first, let's characterize our alkyl substrate or our alkyl halide. This iodine right here is secondary. Secondary substrates are favorable for both SN1 and SN2. So now we really got to take a look at our nucleophile because this will help us decide if we'll go SN1 or SN2. Here we have methanol. Methanol is not negatively charged. Um, this is a polar product solvent because it is an alcohol. We know that polar product solvents favor SN1 reactions, so we know that this is going to be SN1. So the first step in an SN1 reaction is our leaving group will leave, which will generate a carbocation intermediate. Always, always, always characterize your intermediate. Is this primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, methyl? This is a secondary carbocation. So I already hinted that um, this example will use a hydride or methyl shift. And so let's go ahead and see what those look like. Um, as we already characterized, this is a secondary carbocation, and we want to rearrange or undergo a hydride or methyl shift so that way we can upgrade our intermediate. So how can we get this intermediate to go from secondary to tertiary? This is whenever we want to look at the carbons that are directly adjacent from our intermediate. So we have this carbon right here, which is containing two hydrogens. And then we have this carbon that's also adjacent that contains a methyl group and one hydrogen. So we wouldn't want to perform any hydride shifts over here because if we were to do so, which is essentially where our hydrogen and carbocation will swap places. If we characterize after we see that our hydrogen and carbocation swapped places, this is still secondary. This really didn't upgrade us. So, Nothing we do on this carbon is going to upgrade. But what about this carbon over here? What if we try to perform a hydride shift over here? So our hydrogen and carbocation will switch places over here.
Now let's characterize this carbocation. This carbo carbocation is tertiary because it is surrounded by one, two, three carbons. So this is tertiary right here. Here we've got our upgrade. I'm going to go on ahead and show y'all why we would not want to perform a methyl shift. What if I were to leave this hydrogen in place but switch out the methyl group? If we were to perform a methyl shift, we'd be moving that methyl group to the top carbon and our carbocation to the bottom carbon, which is secondary. So here we wouldn't have any upgrades. So in this example, this is the route we would want to go. We would want to perform a hydride shift on this bottom carbon. So now that we have generated our most stable intermediate, now we're ready to have our nucleophile attack. Our nucleophile in this example is methanol. Again, it is a polar aprotic solvent. Sorry, not aprotic. It is polar product. It can form hydrogen bonds. But that oxygen is going to attack the carbocation. leaving our oxygen in a positive state. To get rid of this positive state and put us in a neutral state, we need to depronate. We're going to depronate with our nucleophile, methanol, and it's going to grab this hydrogen and the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen is gonna to go to our oxygen in the form of lone pairs putting it in a neutral state. So that is what the SN1 mechanism looks like. So that is going to be the end of chapter six, part two, alkyl halides, where I covered nucleophilic substitution, um, please feel free to email me.